Hello everyone, I am Dr. Prashant and in this presentation we will talk about Addison's disease. Before we move on to Addison's disease, let us discuss the basic physiology behind the hypothalamo-pituitary adrenal axis. This is the kidney and this is the adrenal gland. This is the pituitary. The hypothalamus secretes corticotropin-releasing hormone. In response to this hormone, the pituitary secretes adrenocorticotrophic hormone or ACTH, in response to which the adrenals secrete cortisol and other hormones. This is the basic structure of the hypothalamo-pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis. Let us move on to adrenal insufficiency. Primary adrenal insufficiency is a disease of the adrenal gland itself. In this disease, the pituitary is secreting more and more ACTH, but the adrenals do not release cortisol. In response, the pituitary secretes more ACTH and still the adrenals do not release cortisol and the pituitary continues this effort of secreting more and more ACTH to kickstart the adrenals, but there is no cortisol. However, in the bargain, because of so much ACTH, there is co-stimulation of the pro opio melanocortin system, which results in melanin deposition in the skin, resulting in hyperpigmentation. Therefore, in primary adrenal insufficiency, the defect or the disease is in the adrenal gland themselves. As a result, despite increased levels of ACTH, as shown by these four blue arrows, there is no cortisol secretion. In the bargain, because of co-stimulation of pro opio melanocortin, there is melanin deposition in the skin resulting in hyperpigmentation. Let us now look at the secondary adrenal insufficiency. And in this, there is a deficiency or defect in the pituitary gland. This results in low ACTH level. As a result, there is no cortisol. This is the basis of secondary adrenal insufficiency. The main difference between primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency or hypoadrenalism is that in primary adrenal insufficiency, mineralocorticoid deficiency is a prominent feature. Whereas in secondary hypoadrenalism, mineralocorticoid deficiency is not prominent because the renin angiotensin system is intact. As we've already discussed, primary adrenal insufficiency is a defect of the adrenal gland itself and this must be remembered. Let us take a look at the causes. It could be autoimmune, part of the autoimmune polyglandular syndromes or polyendocrine syndromes, type 1 and 2, infections such as tuberculosis, histoplasmosis, human immunodeficiency virus or the cytomegalovirus, various malignancies, Infiltrative disorders such as hemochromatosis and amyloidosis. Hemorrhage into the adrenal glands can occur because of Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome, as seen in meningococcemia. There could be ACTH resistance syndromes to these gene mutations. There could be inherited conditions like adrenal leukodystrophy, and there could be congenital adrenal hypoplasia due to DAX1 mutations. Secondary hypoadrenalism or secondary adrenal insufficiency is due to a disease in the pituitary and this must be remembered. The causes are exogenous glucocorticoid therapy, hypopituitarism, removal of pituitary adenomas and pituitary tumors as well as surgery in the pituitary area. There could also be pituitary apoplexy, granulomatous disorders of the pituitary such as tuberculosis and sarcoidosis, secondary tumor deposits, and postpartum pituitary infarction, which is also called Sheehan syndrome. Here are a few rare inherited causes of adrenal insufficiency, and these include adrenal hypoplasia congenita, familial glucocorticoid deficiency, adrenal leukodystrophy, as already discussed, and Algrove or triple A syndrome. Let us now move on to the clinical features of adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease. The clinical features may be acute or chronic. Let us now take a look at acute adrenal insufficiency. Adrenal crisis or acute adrenal insufficiency is characterized by dehydration, hypotension, shock, nausea, vomiting and history of vomiting or weight loss, abdominal pain and unexplained hypoglycemia. 
Other clinical features of adrenal crisis include hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, azotemia. There could also be hyperpigmentation and vitiligo and there could be hypothyroidism or gonadal failure along with other endocrine or autoimmune deficiencies. The clinical features of chronic adrenal insufficiency include skin pigmentation in sun-exposed areas, weakness, tiredness, abdominal pain, nausea, postural hypotension, loss of axillary and pubic hair due to loss of androgen secretion from the adrenals, and finally, the neuropsychiatric manifestations such as depression, psychosis, or memory impairments as well. The clinical features of adrenal insufficiency may also be divided into signs which include hyperpigmentation, weight loss, vitiligo, and auricular calcification, symptoms such as weakness, tiredness, fatigue, GI symptoms, salt craving, and laboratory abnormalities such as electrolyte disturbances, azotemia, anemia, and eosinophilia. The lab diagnosis of adrenal crisis and adrenal insufficiency is important. Let us take a look at the options. The routine biochemical profile includes hyponatremia which is present in more than 85% of patients, hyperkalemia is present in about 60% of patients, abnormalities of liver enzymes and elevations in thyroid stimulating hormones is present in a small subset of patients. Mineralocorticoid status is often neglected but important. And finally, the evaluation of the hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis. The HPA axis is ascertained through a basal cortisol, an insulin tolerance test, an ACTH stimulation test, or an overnight metyrapone test. The basal cortisol is insensitive and non-confirmatory, and in general, a level of more than 14.5 micrograms per deciliter indicates an intact HPA axis. However, most patients will require to undergo an ACTH stimulation test. In the ACTH stimulation test, we give the patient 250 micrograms of ACTH, which is available in a pre-filled syringe. This preparation is called cosentropin or tetracosactin in certain countries. In primary adrenal insufficiency, the ACTH level is already high. Therefore, giving the patient a little more ACTH is not going to make any difference and the adrenals will not be stimulated to secrete any cortisol. In contrast, in secondary adrenal insufficiency, since there is an absolute deficiency of ACTH, giving a small amount such as a 250 microgram dose of ACTH will result in the adrenals secreting cortisol. Other tests for adrenal insufficiency include the insulin tolerance test as already described, the corticotropin releasing hormone stimulation test and this is done to differentiate between a pituitary and a hypothalamic cause, a serum ACTH level. Serum ACTH levels will be high in primary adrenal insufficiency and low in secondary adrenal insufficiency as already discussed. And finally, antibodies to 21 hydroxylase may also be used to test for the causes of adrenal insufficiency. The treatment of Addison's disease includes IV access with a large bore cannula. Samples must be drawn for electrolytes, plasma cortisol, ACTH and glucose, and the treatment must begin before the results. IV hydrocortisone, 100 mg every six hours forms the mainstay of initial treatment and resuscitation with two to three liters of normal saline must be done as soon as possible. We must watch for fluid overload. The subacute management of adrenal crisis includes a search for the underlying cause, determine the type of adrenal insufficiency, whether it is primary or secondary, to continue and taper steroids as required and to begin mineralocorticoid replacement after IV normal saline has been stopped. The long-term management of adrenal crisis includes glucocorticoid maintenance, which is generally hydrocortisone 15 to 20 mg on awakening and 5 to 10 mg in the early afternoon. This most closely resembles the body's natural secretion of cortisol. 
Fludrocortisone is added at a dose of 0.1 mg orally and salt intake is liberalized. In case the patient has a minor febrile illness, he must increase the glucocorticoid dose to 2 or 3 times but should not increase the mineralocorticoid dose. This is called stress dosing. If there is major illness or trauma, then the patient must inject pre-filled dexamethasone 4 mg intramuscular and contact a physician immediately. And during surgery, we must give the patient 100 mg intravenously hydrocortisone three times a day and taper to a usual dose by halving the dose every day. Finally, all patients with Addison's disease must have a medical alert necklace or a medical alert bracelet. That's it for our presentation on Addison's disease. We will see you in the next video.